For part two, please welcome the panel on Fostering Global Connectivity and Economic Growth, moderated by Executive Director of Fortune Live Media, Diane Brady. we get on stage. So we have an excellent panel for you here. And uh, it's, it's a little mixed up from my notes, so forgive me, but let me introduce everybody that we have here. I'm Diane Brady. We have um, is it Dr. Minar Al-Munif at the far end, Chief Investment Officer of NEOM. And then we have Mohammed Al-Sawadi, Chief Investment Officer, North and South America for the Qatar Investment Authority. And then, of course, we have uh, Sarah Al-Suhaimi, uh, chairperson of the board for, of course, uh, Saudi Tadawul Group. Tadawul, yes. yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I know that very well. It's, we keep writing about it because Tadawul. you guys are absolutely rocking. And then, of course, we I'm going to say Your Excellency, but Tadawul. I was told I cannot. So <laughs> Halfan Valhol, who is CEO of the Dubai Future Fund, and, of course, you've already seen my friend and colleague, Dina Powell. Uh, actually, we're not colleagues. We've just sort of practically passed we've practically each other colleagues. a long time. <laughs> Dina Powell McCormick, who is vice chair, president, and head of global client services for BDT and MSD Capital. Let me start and pivot a little bit off your conversation um, with His Excellency. I was recently talking to a CEO of a major utility in the US, and he was lamenting the state of the grid. And he said, you know, if I had a data center, I'd put it in Saudi Arabia. So there you go. <laughs> that, that was completely unprompted. And it's, it's very so interesting true. that that keeps coming up. I want to talk about, let's just start with the geopolitical tensions you talked about. I would love to know how it's impacting what you do in your business. And I'm going to start with you, Manar. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to be with all of you here today. Uh, Geopolitics is, is definitely concerning, but it's not new for the region. Let's be just practical and pragmatic about it. Our region, we've had geopolitics for the last 60 years, I would say, and the region continue to strive, the region continue to grow. Across the entire GCC, you can see our GDP have actually more than doubled in the last 30 years. Significant progress is going through the economies that we have in the GCC. A major work example, you've heard His Excellency speaking about Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. And a main driver of that is actually to focus on diversification, creating opportunities. The same thing apply for Qatar, for the UAE. Everyone is working toward a vision of actually creating opportunities, focusing on improving the quality of life, as well as diversification. Geopolitics will exist and will continue to exist, but I don't think so it's holding anyone's back. Actually, the growth that we're seeing in the region is significant, and I believe the numbers speak uh, for themselves about the GDP growth, as well as the significant progress that is taking place uh, across the GCC. Mohammed, how about for you? I, I would add a couple of things. So uh, one is the location of, of the GCC is quite central. And uh, yes, there is definitely, unfortunately, uh, complications in the geopolitical side very close to our homes, which we hope get resolved. But even globally, there's a lot of geopolitical huge matters, um, uh, whether it's been east, east and west, and you have the China, US, um, uh, you know, reconfiguration of the commercial relationship. So we think that the central location as well um, adds to our advantage with time. Uh, the second point I'll make is that in the geopolitical, generally, I think um, we uh, generally globally we would have to find ways to re, uh, reconfigure hope within the younger generations. And this is where a lot of the GCC in the Middle East focus is implanting hope within the younger generation and inclusivity among them. I was going to say Mrs. al Suhami, but I feel since I'm saying, uh, I'm, we're all going to go first name Sarah, let me go to you um, in terms of um, how is it impacting the Saudi Stock Exchange and your investments. Thank you. Um, I think I agree with uh, what my fellow panelists have uh, uh, said. Um, I think as far as the uh, stock exchange is um, concerned, um, um, 
our market last year in 2023 has performed has gained 13% way ahead of the 10% uh, gain of the MSCI Emerging Market Index um, on a, from volumes, a perspective, and liquidity as well. This past quarter, we have uh, averaged 2.4 billion uh, uh, trading every day in comparison to 1.4 the year before in 2023. So I think um, uh, having um, a clarity in, um, and Vision 2030, uh, is, uh, is key in this um, stability because companies are very clear on what to invest and where, uh, where to invest it. And I think this is um, um, uh, key in uh, decision making. And uh, as far as uh, foreign um, investors and foreign capital flowing into the kingdom is concerned, uh, I think we have seen uh, great numbers. Uh, today we have uh, almost $100 billion invested in the uh, Saudi market and the peg to the dollar also helped de-risk the whole situation. So I think uh, business is usual. Okay. Arfan, you are investing in sort of the startup ecosystem in Dubai. How, how are things uh, changing with Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, good to be here with everyone. Honored to be here. That's my first time in Milken, and I'm enjoying my time. Amazing Welcome. meeting. So <laughs> thank you so much. I'll, I'll maybe take a step back and say, yes, geopolitical conflicts, but let me take a step back and say, conflicts in general and i think this is those there are things that maybe by design and i think the the his excellency the minister alluded them to them so eloquently but i think there were challenges around the world out of which some are uh, geopolitical but you also have i mean challenges that we've seen in the past 10 years whether it's i mean economical conflicts between um, um, different countries around the world whether it's how the world led I mean, uh, or, 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 or uh, faced COVID. Those are all conflicts and challenges that the world has faced. I think because of the priority of what the GCC had focused on, once those things happened, a part of it is by design because of this vision that the minister has mentioned to us yeah. that we are really focusing on the human capital and, and creating prosperity. Those are the by design and the, and the forward thinking of, of the region. Other things that are not by design, which are unfortunate around the world, which led to more appetite to the region. When things happened, if I talk about COVID, for example, as small as the GCC is, and if I talk about the UAE, I think a population of around 10 million, but I think the management of COVID, for example, we took a massive economical punch in the beginning when there was a lockdown. And if, if again, going back to the word by design, if COVID was by design, you feel like, and I'm not, I'm not saying it is by design, if it was by design, you feel like the designer wanted to hammer Dubai specifically because of <laughs> the economical dependency on tourism, logistics, yeah. and beyond. But there was a big message that health and safety was a priority, so there was the lockdown, and we took that punch, but then we handed over the, the trust to the people, and then you saw the, the economy recovering to even better than 2019. But that's one side. Then you go to the conflicts and the geopolitical conflicts, uh, the message was in the GCC that we focus on, on creating a prosperous, inclusive um, economy uh, uh, based on talent and human. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, um, while people are facing conflicts all over the world, they see the GCC as home. And, and, and I'm not saying we're perfect, we've done so many mistakes, but I'm just saying that the priority was set right, and hence the impact on the numbers from an economy perspective actually worked in our favor while there are conflicts all over the world. Great. Uh, and Dina, you know, in addition to your current role, you've also been Deputy National Security Advisor. I know that you worked on the Abraham Accords. You had 16 years at Goldman Sachs. Uh, bring that to bear in terms of um, what you see happening right now and, and the impact. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting, as you hear from um, His Excellency, um, El Falah before and, and this panel, there's just so much optimism, so much hope, so much investment in a more peaceful and prosperous future. And yet I think at this moment, if we're being you know, really forthright, it's as if the region has um, a big tension, an access of resilience, which is these extraordinary leaders, 80% of the population of the GCC under the age of 35, initiatives like Vision Elon 2030. Elon Musk would love that, by the way. Yes. <laughs> All the conversations around That's what's right. happening in the world. That's right. 
but you know, uh, obviously green technology. Um, frankly, you, you also have leaders who like in the Abraham Accords took steps forward to say, we want to work together. We want to have a more peaceful platform. And so you have all of this happening and as investors, these huge opportunities to see a diversification away from natural resources to AI biotech, longevity. So this access of resilience, which is all forward looking. But you also have an access of resistance. Iran and the proxies that they fund, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and the Houthis. And this access to them is terrifying. They are resisting it at every term because it's more uh, positive. It means that hopefully we'll find a path to actually see more um, of the Abraham Accords b b being built upon, Saudi and Israel potentially normalizing. And so they're doing everything they can to stop that. And I truly believe, even though we had the horrific devastation of October 7th, even though we're seeing the tragedy in Gaza, I really believe that the access of resilience will ultimately prevail. Okay, that's, I think that's real. And I, I think one of the things that's most exciting is when you look at the projects, you know, as a reporter, I want to go back to you, Minara, because Neom is very cool, very ambitious. I know it's a multi-year project. Give us a sense of where things are right now. And, and for those who don't know about it, also tell us a bit about the vision around it, because I think it's quite, it's quite bold. There's a lot of opportunities as well for foreign investors to engage. Absolutely, that's the first time someone calls Neom cool, but we'll take oh, it. I think it's cool. I mean, I'm looking it at the pictures. Cool. I'm looking at the cool. I'm looking at the pictures. Absolutely, the, yeah. It is. It is a cool project. It's something that's going to change humanity, not for my generation, but for my new generations to come, hopefully. And if we go back to the vision of Neom, it's actually at the core of what Saudi Arabia is trying to do. When we say Vision 2030 is about diversification. Vision 2030 is about improving the quality of life and creating opportunities. And that's exactly at the core of what we're trying to do at NEOM. At NEOM, our vision, if you look at our vision statement, which is simply, is to be able to attract the best talent and give them all the opportunity to develop the most pioneering ideas. And the only limitation they have is their imagination. So it's all about human capital. How do you attract them? How do you create the right environment for them to develop the most innovative ideas with no limitation except their imagination? And if you think of Neom, we always brand Neom as it is an opportunity not only for Saudi Arabia, but for the globe. Because simply we're doing something that's never been done before at a scale that's not even been heard before around the world. It's an opportunity for us to together work collectively on redefining livability. How can we create the right environment for people to live at? How can we really build everything focused on humans, giving time back to them? It's an opportunity to redefine conservation and really test how serious are we when we speak about the environment? What are the steps that we're taking forward to develop this? And NEOM, as everyone knows, it's been developed on 100% renewable energy as a base load. So that's creating a mix of different types of energy plus introducing new technologies. Who would have thought Saudi Arabia, the world capital of oil and gas, to be the leader when we speak of green hydrogen? No one would even think Saudi would do it. Can I take it down a level before we move on? Can you give us some near-term sense of what's next? I mean, give us a sense of what's happening on the ground right now. And for this audience, what can they expect to come next in terms of just actual you know, here's where you can engage. Because there's, again, there's many pillars to this project. It's many years. Absolutely. So the first project that's going to come to life is Sindala, one of our islands in the Red Sea. This is opening its door for everyone to be with us by the end of the year. Green hydrogen, it's going to be announced opening and functional by end of 2025. Trujina, which is our year-round mountain destination, will host the Asian Winter Games by December 2029 and then we continue from one project to the other. What's important to mention over there, it's not only the timeline, but the actual progress that you see on the ground. As an example, the line, which is a revolution when it comes to urban living, the first vertical city globally that was developed on a concept that this is a, you know, a long-term project that is gonna be developed on a modular basis, really looking at different steps to develop it. 
It's gonna be developed on phases, with the first phase developing the first three modules. This is continuing. Today, if you see progress on site, on the line as an example, you have more than 4,000 trucks and earth moving equipment, moving more than 3 million tons cubic meter of soil on a weekly base. Just to put it into perspective, that's enough soil to fill more than 1,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. So I don't think so you see this kind of scale of such project anywhere around the world. Right. So progress is moving. Um, so let me move on, Mohammed, to you in terms of both the investment strategy, but give us a sense of, you know, regional integration, regional support. I mean, in terms of, um, tell us about where Qatar is today and as you're looking at just the, um, the strategy that you have, but also some of the opportunities you're seeing. I'm, I'm looking, I'm pivoting to off some of the questions that are coming in. Yeah, on, on the regional integration, there is a lot of integration. I mean, you speak the same language, you have very similar systems uh, across the GCC that is relatively quite efficient infrastructure. If you look at it from an efficiency point of view across the GCC, we have the best um, infrastructure when it comes to um, hard infrastructure. At the same point of time, it is from a fiber optic and from technology infrastructure is actually quite developed. So this promotes a lot of integration uh, on the GCC side from, um, you, you alluded a little bit to the investment activity. So an investment activity in the GCC 2013, so just flick out into kind of m &A transactions, they're four times uh, more than what they used to be 2018. So 18, it was around 25 billion dollars, and in 2023, there is about 100 billion dollars. So there's definitely a lot of activity, and from integration point of view, there is more and more willingness um, of integration. The last thing I'll say is more on human capital. So demographics are uh, clear. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's one of the lowest average age when it comes uh, globally. Um, literacy, you know, the amount of education is quite high, um, relatively speaking. Um, and the last thing I'll say, even if you look into leaderships, um, we have uh, one of the best leaderships um, globally, I would argue, I'm biased, obviously. And, and then uh, even the average age is quite low, which promotes integration and, and openness for integration. So all these kind of aspects are on the right side. Fundamentals are there, and there is more and more collaboration. It's always been, and it's increasing with time. You know, I think one of the things that's, um, and I think that's great, and I do want to talk as well with all of you about some of the ways in which there are technologies that have been leapfrogging the West. I think there's a lot of, the perceptions, I think, are quite behind where you are, even some of the revelations up here today in terms of what's happening in your areas. One of the things I think is very interesting, Sarah, for you is give us a sense of what's happening. What kinds of, what kind of listings are you seeing the flavor and the um, evolution of the exchange? Um, thank you for uh, this question. So <clears throat> maybe it would be easier uh, to understand the evolution of the exchange if uh, I give you a snapshot of the Saudi capital market prior to Vision 2030. Someone uh, today said that all stories start with Vision 2030, but that is the reality. It is the main enabler that uh, it changed uh, everything in the country. So uh, if we go back to 2016, the Saudi capital market was a local market, only local, and equity market. There was no other uh, markets. We were uh, um, a large market, the largest in the GCC, uh, but we were the 25th or 26th market by, um, by uh, uh, yeah, 25, 25th or 26th uh, largest by market cap globally. Uh, for, and, and that was it. Uh, we had a very good, very good system. We had really good uh, regulations. Uh, however, we were uh, extremely closed. Uh, fast forward to today. Today, Tadawul is uh, a holding group. Uh, we have four subsidiaries and we, are, uh, we invest also in four other companies. We are listed. Uh, we are open for uh, foreign investment. We have joined all leading uh, um, indices for emerging markets. Uh, we have uh, over $100 billion invested from uh, foreign investors. Um, and uh, today we have uh, our equity market uh, is the ninth largest globally. 
Um, uh, we also have a debt market, which is one of our uh, priorities uh, uh, going forward to uh, enable and grow this market. We have uh, the uh, only derivatives market in the uh, GCC. We, um, we launched three products, index futures, single stock futures, and single stock options. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we have uh, the largest depository center, which is a, a world-class and uh, very well-regulated uh, and structured um, uh, uh, depository center. Uh, all this was enabled by Vision 2030. Um, and uh, the number of listings in 2016 was 125 companies. Today we have uh, uh, 400 listings, of which is uh, more than 300 uh, companies listed on the exchange. Right. I also want to talk about, we'll talk separately about investments in the region. Halfan, talk about um, the startup ecosystem, I believe, um, obviously, Dubai has been in the front. Everybody knows it. We're seeing Saudi Arabia come up. Is that helpful as you see the region itself become more of a center for entrepreneurial talent? Absolutely, and we'd love for more countries as well from the GCC to contribute to this, and I'll tell you why. I mean, obviously, I mean, His Excellency, the minister mentioned the, the biggest, I mean, uh, from an investment perspective, the highest number is with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. If I'm not mistaken, it's north of a billion in, in 2023. Um, UAE stands at around 600 plus million in 2023. Uh, but the point is that we need more of this. I mean, uh, a clear example is you look at the transactions that happened in the region. You look at when Uber came in and acquired Karim, which is the hailing app uh, of the region, when you look at how uh, Amazon acquired Souk. For them, they acquired those businesses because those businesses dominated the region. And when you speak to those entrepreneurs and founders, they don't tell you we're based in the UAE and we're stuck to the UAE. They have a massive market in the Kingdom of Saudi and they want to expand more. So that's, as we all know, I mean, back in the days when there was brick and mortar businesses, you look at the confined, um, uh, yeah. a population around you as your target market. Nowadays, a click of a button and the, the globe becomes your market. So the message is, it's not about where the investment is. I think the biggest challenge is how can you create seamless uh, regulations and whoever has attended, I mean, um, Elon Musk's session today and he talked about how the over-regulated areas can be a massive risk. And I think if we look at it as, as a GCC, more investment is amazing, but if there was friction when it comes to policies and reg regulations for those founders of other businesses to set up in one place and scale up in a click of a button, this is what we need. So what we need would you change if you could wave a wand? What, where, where on the regulatory front is the most friction? So no, I think, it's, I think uh, the wand would be focused on, on agility in general. Agility when uh, getting, but we're fortunate in, in, in our governments in the GCC where our, our leaders are very close to us. I mean, I personally speak about myself. My chairman at the Dubai Future Foundation is the Crown Prince, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, whenever there's something that needs to be disruptive, Literally, leaders are a WhatsApp away, and we can change things fast. And I think, I think you're WhatsApping the so, so, so policies are That's really good to and, know. And, uh, uh, when when you have access to decision makers, whether you want to apply last mile delivery for drones to test them, or you want to apply blockchain for land acquisitions and transactions, in a safe manner, of course. So sandboxes are key here. So you need to create this right transition, where innovators aren't stopped. The, 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 the safe environment for testing in sandbox environments is there, and the quick decisions, because uh, I'm sure all the investors here, whether you're on the VC or on the entrepreneurial side, you'd understand that whatever policies and regulations are there now, innovation will come in, and we need to introduce new regulations that are friendly uh, with those new innovations. And there's no chance that your policies are, will be at par with the innovations, because it's just too fast. So the closer you are, the smaller that delta is, um, um, then the faster you are as a government. And I think this is the magic one, to ensure that you're really fast, agile, and safe. Do you want to weigh in on that? Because especially in terms of as you're looking around the region, where do you see points? I'm going to characterize it as points of opportunity or points of friction, you tell me. And I'd love to hear others weigh in, too, in terms of where are the opportunities to create more of a seamless experience and for entrepreneurs, investors, and others? 
Well, certainly from an investment perspective, um, I, I, I do think he's one click away <laughs> from uh, the Crown Prince being able to make those decisions. And obviously in the US and other regions in the world, there's a little more regulation, Diane, mm -hmm. as you know, and a little more complexity. Um, and as we think about global competitiveness, that's pretty you know, significant. At BDT and MSD Partners, that's a merchant bank that's really had decades of experience working with the most um, significant families and founders around the world who view things in a bit of a different way from a very long-term capital horizon, investing in sectors that they uniquely have understanding of and expertise in, um, but really not sort of having that three to five year immediate return perspective, but really you're a, a strong um, advisor, uh, that's somebody that you can count on you know, for a really long time. And we've seen that with Michael Dell, of course, um, as it is a, is a significant uh, amount of his capital and Byron Trott and, and Greg Lemkow. And I think our approach when we think about investing in the region is very aligned because it's long term, it's strategic in nature, it's very forward looking. What are the technologies? What are the innovations that are available now um, that you have to move quickly on and you have to be pretty innovative, but you've got to stick. You've got to stick for the long haul. And I think that's what um, you know we, we need to see more of. And maybe that's a risk that some of us see is that there are uh, some investors who want to come in and out. Yeah. <laughs> and if we know one thing about the Middle Not East. Not a good place to date. Uh, and exactly. And if we know one thing about the region, long-term relationships, especially with the most important institutions and families, many of which you see here today, um, it's the differentiator for who they want to work with. Absolutely. Are you seeing that, Sarah? I mean, I'm very curious. We're in a U.S. setting. We're often talking to U.S. investors. Well, I'm also aware of the broader global landscape, you know, how, give us a sense of where you're seeing pockets of interest around the world, because I think sometimes we believe the view here is the worldview, it's very much not. Uh, well, I'm biased, but I think we have uh, great opportunities in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I recall in the beginning when we were, uh, in the beginning of my chairmanship of uh, the Saudi Tadawal, uh, we were on um, a business trip uh, before uh, actually opening up the market for foreign investors. And an investor, um, an American investor, told me, why would we invest in uh, the Saudi Stock Exchange if it's highly correlated with oil? Um, so we can just have exposure to oil. And uh, that made me think, and I remembered this yesterday, so I went and looked up the correlation for the last 20 years. And I divided that into two uh, eras, the pre-Vision 2030 uh, decade and the uh, post-Vision 2030 decade. And he was right. The years from 2004 to 2014 showed a highly correlated uh, uh, performance of the Saudi uh, market index uh, with uh, the price of crude oil, with uh, both of them uh, gaining 88% uh, and 82% respectively. So it was extremely close. But what happened in the last decade when so many changes happened and uh, more diversification uh, uh, took place, uh, we introduced, um, uh, th there are more sectors in the market that did not exist before, like digital, sport, retail, healthcare, uh, a lot of businesses that are built on the demographics of Saudi Arabia. Uh, many of you may, might not know that 75% of the Saudi population is, 70% of the Saudi population is less than 35 years old. And um, so with a country that has the resources, has a plan, has the human capital and the energy and belief in where we want to go, things will happen. So when I looked at the correlation now, and as uh, His Excellency, uh, uh, the Minister of Investment mentioned that the non-oil GDP reached 50% uh, this, uh, uh, this past year, um, uh, I found that uh, while uh, uh, the prices of crude oil declined by 28%, the stock market has actually gained 44%. Yeah. Was this a coincidence? No, it was a result of what we have been doing. So I do think that there is a huge opportunity in the re region as we develop, and we take this seriously. We know and understand that uh, we need to keep on uh, uh, investing, we need to keep on developing the market, and uh, this, the, while the capital market is an enabler and and uh, for uh, capital 
uh, formation. Uh, I, I also believe that it is uh, one way that we can show the international community uh, what's happening in the region through looking at the performance of our stock market. Yeah, I think that, and I'm reminding everybody uh, to submit your questions by the QR code. Um, Benar, I think, and, and I'd like actually all of us to answer this, I think one of the opportunities in this platform, I'm a journalist who's worked internationally, I've personally seen so much of the progress in the Middle East, but of course, you know, there's a question here about conditions for women. You know, I think we talk about the starting point, where these countries are today and to recognize the progress. But when you think, give us a sense of the narrative that, that you want to be talking about as, as a woman in this region. I'd love to hear from both of you, but I think that's very important here because it's always one of the first questions that I get as a journalist is this sense but it's not like us, it's not like this. How, give us a sense of how you feel, and of course I know there's more headlines that sometimes uh, make things set back. Tell us what, uh, how you want to be, us to be thinking about the well, position of women in particular. Well, as a woman, I think so. It's, uh, it's remarkable to see the progress and the speed of how the progress has been made. It's unbelievable. If you came to Saudi Arabia 10 years ago, Six years ago, you will not recognize the country that you see today. Today, we are on par with top countries around the world. You know, the equality, it's there. Opportunities are available. We have a growing population, youth, that is so hungry for opportunities, that is so passionate about what's going on, and they really want to be able to contribute and play a significant role. That starts from the leadership that opened the door, provided the opportunities and the vision, simply saying, why can't we be? We have everything that, you know, you have the vision, you have the power, you have the ambition, you really have the youth to change and make things happen. So you're seeing a driving force of youth population that really do not have any limits, and they want to continue to drive, develop, and make things happen. And as a woman, that's for me is, uh, first of all, a sense of pride. I'm so proud to be part of a country that is really making things different, focusing on people, and really proud to be part of this era specifically, and seeing the significant transformation that's happening. You will not see a country around the world that is doing what Saudi Arabia is doing today in terms of project, the diversification, the ambition, the plan. It is just remarkable to be part of that journey, specifically at this time. Let, let me switch a bit, and I don't know if you want to add anything, Sarah, just, uh, but I think, uh, let me switch a bit, Mohammed, to you be, uh, before we get some final remarks. I'm going to put you in my seat. You're the guest, you know, guest editor. What should we be writing about Qatar and the region? Give us a sense of the narrative that, that um, you think is not being told here, just in uh, many times, I think the good, uh, actually, a lot of the facts, a couple of things. First of all, in Eastern cultures, many times, it's out of generosity. You don't really speak about the things that you do. So when someone is coming to your home, you'll get them with, you know, with, uh, you know, with respect, and you would say, and you would take care of them, and you would say the good things. But many times, actually, we will overlook uh, how much we could emphasize and market ourselves. Uh, maybe add to the comment to women empowerment. Uh, if you look into organizations within the Middle East, you'll find, um, you know, big, in my organization, I don't have the stats for everyone here on the panel, but in my uh, institution, we have about 40% participation, 40 women, 40%. Some of them actually are leadership positions. Mm -hmm. um, in Qatar, we have a few people in cabinets that are super qualified, and they're, you know, um, um, they're, they're, they're women, and the same thing we had in Emirates and Saudi and across the board. So many times I think it's out of uh, us actually uh, not speaking much about it and, and things that we contribute overall, uh, which can be overseen. But I think the other thing is, is uh, how is things we could think about and spend time on is, like any region around the world, is how do we create, um, and this is a collaboration that should happen between media, between leaders, between regional leaders in our regions, how do we actually make sure that hope, hope is sustainable? Uh, GCC is, is blessed with many resources and it, and it had its complications, but also we are in a very quiet, a troubled neighborhood. So yeah. how do you make sure that everyone around us actually have a sustainable hope? Um, uh, so between facts, between leadership on both sides, uh, this could be really right. seen into. 
So I see we have the five minute warnings. I'm giving each of you a minute to sum up sort of the takeaways for the audience. And also it can be whatever you want. I'm gonna start with you, Dina. Well, thank you for moderating this uh, panel. It's been great to be here. And I agree, Mike Milken brings a pretty remarkable group of people together. It gets better every year. You know, I think that maybe my takeaway is that there's a lot of reason uh, to be uh, worried about the world today and, and, and scared <laughs> with all the conflicts that you see around the world, with a lot of the most important global investors talking about a softer and softer landing, uh, not being maybe as realistic uh, as they had hoped and you see with inflation and deficit. Um, but I think that there are really important bright spots. And I think the Middle East is a bright spot, as strange as that sounds right now, in terms of the investing, the focus areas, the young ambitions. But I think that it means we have to be strong allies. And I speak, you know, this is a, a former government official. I think it's more important than ever to stand with our allies, to stand with the leaders that represent the access of resilience. How fun. Again, I reiterate, thank you for moderating this session. And you've got to hear her uh, Scottish accent. So if you have I a chance, I will do you need, that later. If that's the drink sec, I'll do my Glaswegian accent. <laughs> Come maybe, by it honestly. Maybe towards the end, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, towards, I mean, um, What's honestly what's mind-boggling for me is when I look at the themes. I mean, if you look at this this theme, it says a shared future, right? If you go to the World Economic Forum, they talk about a fragmented world and rebuilding trust. If you come to the World Government Summit in in <laughs> Dubai and the UAE, it's the same theme. What's confusing for me is when you look at those global conflicts, it's nothing that has to do with shared interest and collaboration and unity. Look at the pandemic small countries and large countries and the way we dealt with it was a complete mess around the world, right? And, and that's one way. Look at the economical conflict around the world. Look at how we're trying to, um, I, I mean, I remember uh, speaking about the World Government Summit. We had uh, Sam Altman uh, join uh, um, on Zoom and uh, when he was asked, what is, the only, what is one thing that, to your point, what is the magic wand? And he was like, we need to um, create some kind of a platform to sit together to figure out how, so he's also, so you talk to the founders, they say we need to unite. You look at the signs, the world is giving us so many signs mm -hmm. that the only way forward is for us all to sit together. Mm. Whether it's a, the, the complex, like I said, from a geopolitical standpoint, whether it's leveraging on startups and having regulations or policies that are not only GCC friendly, but global friendly. So, um, I mean, getting all those issues away from us. So I think the signs are there. It's just about us um, really, um, in, I mean, doing the actions. And I'm not saying we're perfect in the GCC. Maybe what you see are the... the we are. Uh, we, we talk about the shiny stuff and the tallest and the biggest. Yes, we do have this, but make no mistake. Yeah. We're like venture capitalists. We double down on the winning bets, but we really pivot and learn from many mistakes that we've done. And I think with this entrust from, from our leaders, we just ride the wave of success and we learn from the mistakes that we do. And the, I think the biggest asset is the guidance from our leaders is to really put politics aside and focus on the human and prosperity. And if you do this, then the world will be safe. Great. Like um, uh, building on that, I think uh, I would like to extend an invitation to everyone to come visit the region, come visit Saudi Arabia to understand it. Because if you're trying to learn it from far away, you will be uh, maybe mostly misguided and uh, there is a huge misperception that can only be corrected if you actually come and visit Saudi and the region and you will find out that we're uh, closer and uh, more similar than there are differences. Great, Mohammed. I'll keep it 20 seconds to give her more time, but basically <laughs> I think uh, if you look into the economical metrics as well as a winning location, uh, the past 20 years, three folds increase in, in GDP. If you look into demographics, it's positive. Um, uh, and if you look into future, energy actually is super important. All, even what you're talking about, AI, thing of that sort, requires energy. And a transformation is happening, diversification is happening. So we're very excited with what we have. We're putting uh, our own capital in the ground, and we're expanding the growth. And whoever would like to, who never come back, come to us, I think is missing out, so. Great, and last word to you, Minar. Growth is the name of the game. The region is gonna to continue to grow, uh, despite everything. Uh, there is a clear focus, there is ambition, there is determination, we're all moving toward it. 
not only with what's existing, but we're also developing new projects, new opportunities to present what the future is going to look like. And I'm proud to be part of NEOM, and we are all opening the doors to you. So when you come to visit Saudi Arabia, make sure you pass by NEOM to see exactly what we're trying to do and hopefully be part of that journey. I see a trip in our futures. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you very much. No Scottish. <laughs> Thank you for attending our lunch program. Be sure to utilize the mobile app to stay up to date on the latest changes. Check out what is happening at the Wellness Garden and other fun offerings throughout the conference. The next session will begin at 2.30 p.m.